please, to submit your code for it to be tested on the XY plotter and to get your data back. Come the final deadline, you've got to submit some data. And in order to get that data, you've got to have sent us your program for us to test it. Now, if you don't submit it next week, it doesn't matter. If you don't submit it the following time, it doesn't matter. You only have to submit it once and get the correct data right. But we're just giving you multiple opportunities to do that. Yeah, That'll make sense if you've read the coursework. If you haven't, you probably just need to read the coursework and it'll make more sense to you. Good. Any other questions? Do you want the lights down a bit? Is that okay? Was that right? Can you see the board all right? Yeah? The other week you were really noisy. This week you're really, really quiet. You're really confusing me. Are you okay? Okay, so let's do a quick recap then of where we're up to. So last week you did the hands-on uh, DAQ lab, and this is really important, okay? Yes, you've sent out, you've uh, outputted an analog signal and read an analog signal, and you've read and written a digital input output signal. Okay, it's not that much. Wow, you've achieved an amazing thing, right? You can control systems. Okay, now you've worked out the fundamental aspects of a digital input output network, communication systems. How do these things work? You've got a little microphone, an analog signal. It uses an analog to digital converter, converts that into digital signals, yeah, which are just noughts and ones, sends it across a bus. That bus then gets read and interpreted. You can do that now. You know the fundamentals of a digital communication system. You can do that. If you want to switch on the, uh, you know, the thrusters of this Spaceship X, you can do that now. It's all analog input, uh, output. It's all digital input, output. You can do any of those things. You can control anything. You can integrate anything. Okay? So that's a real important learning objective that we have met. So what are we looking at this week? Okay? Uh, group project reminders, we've covered that. We're going to look a bit of arrays um, and uh, that aspect of it because we've had a few videos on that, which is quite interesting. We'll see why arrays are important. We'll have a quick recap on clusters. Then we're going to look at self-assessment quiz engagements today, so how far you've all got with those. We'll have a bit of a review. We're going to do some MCQ exercises, so it's going to be interactive today rather than you ju me just talk at you all the way through and you get bored. We're going to do some questions and we're going to check our understanding to some fundamental things. We're also going to practice for the final examination, which is an MCQ examination. So we're going to get used to the style that we get for these MCQ questions. And at the end of it, if you've got them all right, fantastic, you're understanding the course. If you've not, still fantastic, you know that you've got to go away and do a bit of a recap and read stuff. So either way, whatever happens, don't worry about how you're doing. Just use that feedback to reflect and, and, and move forwards. We're then going to look at the uh, assessment criteria exercise, and we're going to look at good programming practice. And this is also really important for your assessment because it's how your group project course, uh, coursework is going to be marked. Okay, good programming practice. Who's done text-based programming before? Yeah, so you all know about syntax, right? Syntax, when you write syntax, you put put code online, and if you submit it to a forum and you've met all of those good programming practices, people will help you. If you haven't, they'll troll you, okay? So good programming practice is a really important element, and we'll look at why that is, is something we're going to do. So let's have a look at a little bit about arrays. Why do we use arrays? We use arrays because they enable us to store information, okay? And it might be, in the case of the group project work, I've got a two-dimensional array, an X and a Y, and the value in that just corresponds to an area. Or it might be, I've got a three-dimensional array, and that three-dimensional array, I'm going to take that 3D space, like this lecture theatre, I'm going to divide it up into lots of small little chunks, and I'm going to say, is something there or not? And how could we take those measurements? We could use a LiDAR. Yeah? So we could use the LiDAR, which takes a laser, it spins it round, does speed distance time measurements, it spins it round and also moves it up and down. So we get a three-dimensional map of the room in here. And why is that important? Well, this is a three-dimensional map, if I just play my video for you. This is a three-dimensional map that we took with a robot called Mirax in Sellafield in a room which is radioactive, which nobody's been in for 50 years. Okay? And this type of work that we do, working in partnership with... Um, with, with Sellafield Limited, probably this has saved them about £5 million pounds just to go in there. So we put a robot, access port through a concrete wall, six-inch port, 
robot that slides in in the tube, unfolds, navigates around. It's got a LiDAR on it that takes this point cloud measurements, and it's got, also got some radiation detectors on it. So what we can do is we can overlay then, if we know what the position is, the radiation mapping with the position of mapping. Why is this important? Because if we've got radiation, then if we've got to send a worker in there and we know where the radiation is, we can plan their trajectory of how to walk on the floor to minimise their exposure to the radiation. Okay? We understand what the radiation is, we can go in there, we can clean it up. We can go in there and we can see what the obstructions are. Okay? So this is why, you know, an example of why we need arrays and why arrays can be useful and hopefully links to something important. So that's that. So what is an array then? Let's just talk about arrays. So array elements and dimensions. So the elements is data that makes the array. Okay, so here we can see a number of elements. We've got 100, 101, 102. These are called the elements of the array. And the dimension is the length or the height. This is just a one-dimensional array. And I know it's a one-dimensional array because here I can see just my control just allows me to change the number and that just sets which element that I'm looking at here. So because this is on zero, that means that this element here is element zero. If I put element two here, if I increase that to 2, that means that next to it would be 102, because it would dis display the second element. So that's all it's doing when it's controlling that. And this is just a one-dimensional one. You can have two-dimensional ones. You can have three-dimensional ones. You can have four-dimensional ones. You can have many different elements. In fact, an array can have m one or more dimensions, and as many as 2 to the power 31 minus 1 um, dimensions. Now, 1D, 2D, 3D makes sense. 4D, you can just get about get your head around. If somebody can explain to me a five-dimensional array, that, that would be really helpful because it's quite difficult to conceptualise. But you can have these arrays with multiple um, uh, dimensionality. So consider using arrays when you look, uh, you work and with a collection of similar data and you want to perform repetitive computations. This is what a two-dimensional, uh, sorry, this is a one-dimensional array again, but we've changed the order. Rather than looking at it as a column, we're looking at it as a row, and we can see this is our index terminal that we have here. So the element is at index zero, uh, is not shown in this image, so here we're just looking at this element, and this element that we can see here is element one, because I've got a one there. Hello. Is that limit for like how many dimensions of an array you can have? Is that like the limit on lab or like So that, so it's two to the power, what was I say, two to the power 32 minus one, that's because it's a 32-bit representation, so that's the number of elements that you can have. So that's, that's just based on the fact that it's 32 bits is the biggest one. Yeah, yeah. so if you do 2 to the power 32, it's some crazy large number. And, and I, I don't think I've ever used anything more than a 3D array. Depends what you're doing, right? The pro I'm sure there are some really interesting applications where you need great dimensionality. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, so this is an example of also of a, of a one-dimensional array. Um, that we can see here. Let's look at LabVIEW then. So let's look at something a little bit more interesting. Let's look at some LabVIEW code and let's look at a two-dimensional array. <coughs> let's go to LabVIEW. So here we go, here's our front panel here of an array, and I've got a one-dimensional array on the front panel. I've also created a two-dimensional array. I can quite easily tell that I've got one-dimensional because I've got one control element. Over here I've got two, so it must be 2D array. Nice trick of LabVIEW is if I click on something on the front panel, it displays where it is on the, on the block diagram. So here I can see this is my two-dimensional array that I've got here with X and Ys, and inside uh, a loop here, I've got my one-dimensional array. Can anybody tell me what this program is doing? What's this program doing? Tell me, sir. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, so, so what it's doing, it's, it's creating a two-dimensional array. And the way this, this is called something called nested loops. So when you have one loop inside another loop, and here we've got two for loops with one loop inside a, uh, another loop. The inside loop is going to create a number of values and put them into an array, and it's going to repeat that several times. Um, it's going to do that five times, 
and then the outer loop is going to iterate. So the inside one's going to run five times before the outside loop iterates, and then the inside loop's going to um, run five more times. And I know the dimensionality of my array is going to be a square array because my two values of n wide to them are five. So it's going to give me a five by five array. And I've also put something else in the loop that's going to help us. And this is a timing function. And this means, remember, that when I wire something here, it's the number of milliseconds to, to wait. So it's going to wait 500 milliseconds between operations. And that's just about quick enough that we can see what's happening when we run it on the front panel. OK, so we can see it. And it's quick enough so it's, we're not here for five minutes waiting for it to finish. OK, so it's a nice um, combination of those two. So let's, let's run this program and look at what happens. So this is my one-dimensional array. So we'll see this populate. And then eventually we'll see this 2D array be populated. When will this 2D array be populated. So we'll see what's happening on the internal one, but this one over here, when, when's the data all going to come, come to us there? Is that going to come to us each time the outside loop finishes? At the, At the very end, yeah. Data can't come out of the loop until the loop is finished. Okay, so that data where we've got a little parentheses here, that data is not going to come out of the loop until that loop is finished. And let's have a quick look. This is good for looking at data representation. Really thin orange wire is a single value. A thicker orange wire is an array. And a, a, double, uh, wire, a double wire, two lines, is, is a multi-dimensional array. Okay? If it was a 3D array, it would still be two wires. Okay? Yeah, but it just means multiple dimensions. So let's run this VR and see what happens then. So it's starting to run. Look, there's the first lot of data in the first array. And if you watch in a second, this should change. So the numbers in that are changing. So that data is only coming out each time that loop finishes. And it moves on to the next iteration, the large one. And when it finishes, all of those values come in here. And if we compare these numbers, the first one is 0.729. I can see the bottom one over here, 0 0.729, 0 0.393, 0 0.393. So you can see this one-dimensional column here is actually a row in my two-dimensional array. Okay, so a simple little bit of um, uh, LabVIEW code to create a two-dimensional array. Uh, why am I going through this with you? It's important to recap arrays, but actually arrays and two-dimensional arrays are going to be important for you for the group project. Okay, so some fundamental things to pull out from that. Let's go back to our slides because we've got quite a bit to go through. And next up is our clusters. So let's have a recap of clusters then. Hello. Tell me. Okay, tell me. So, so the way it populates, you mean? Yeah. So it's the way this. So what's happening with the little the little tunnel with the parentheses? It's storing those values up. So the first time you've seen the one D array, that's because all the values have been stored at that tunnel, and then the loop finishes, and those five values have come out, and they're stored in that array. On the right hand side there, it stores those up, and then it puts it into a two dimensional array. If you want to change the order that that's mapped in, you've probably got to do that at a lower level. And to do that at a lower level, you can have an array function, and you could have, it's called insert into array, and you could tell it which, uh, what the location was in terms of the row and the column. So you could set that up programmatically to put it however you want. You can also do array functions with this, so you can take the transpose of the array and move it around. And if you, get, if you go all the way through and you do the MNs and you do robotics, you'll see arrays are really, really important, or matrices, which we can represent for arrays, are a fundamental aspect of robotics. We cannot do modern robotics without arrays. Yeah? So it's, that's just the default, but you could set it up to do it however you want it. OK, cool. Let's have, a look at, let's have a look at clusters, then. I'll put these on Blackboard for I think they're already on Blackboard for you, so you can have a look at them. So this is a cluster. Why do we use a cluster? Well, we use a cluster because, and I know this is a cluster, because it's a solid uh, uh, thick line with dots on it. 
Okay, this is pink, which means it's got data in it. You see other ones that are yellow and various else. Okay, so here we can see that, that a brown one means that it's time-dimensional data. So I've created a cluster here. Why do I use a cluster? Because it lets put me put multiple types of data of different types in a single wire. If I had all the separate wires on my diagram, okay. But when I start to do big applications and I have loads and loads of wires, right, you're going to open up your VI and it's going to look like spaghetti, right? And you don't want to be like, right, where does this wire go to? Okay, that's that. It'll just be really difficult to understand. Whereas if I put all of that data in a cluster, so one wire, and I wire that uh, through the front, of, uh, through the left hand side and to the right hand side of my loop, I know what the data's there. And actually, if I'm doing something like a, uh, a while loop, and I use a shift register, then I could store all of my data in a cluster, and then each time the loop executes, I could decide which data I want to use and which data I want to put into it. So it's a really powerful way of storing data and accessing data to make it nice and neat and easy to see and easy to understand and program with. So it's called a cluster. And if I click on this cluster here, it will show me where that is in the front panel, and I've put three things in my cluster here. Okay, I've put this thing here called name, which is a string. I've put this thing in here, which is graduated, which is a Boolean. And I've put this thing in here, which is a numeric, and it's age. Okay, so I can store three pieces of information uh, there. And then inside my loop, all I'm doing here, this is just an example, I've set it up to run every 100 milliseconds. All I've done is I've used this function over here, which is called unbundle by name. There's unbundle and unbundle by name. I always use unbundle by name because I can select what it is that I want to do by the name that I've given it on the front panel. So here I've said name, but if I left click on it with my, with my uh, little button here, I can change it to something else. I can say age. You'll see that my wire changes to a cross because my indicator name is string and my data type is now age, which is a double precision, so the data types don't match. Okay, but you could pull anything that you wanted out of here. And if I drag on the bottom over here, I can drag it down and I can select different ones for different things. Why is that powerful? Well, if you have, I'll come to you a second. If I had a cluster and I had, say, I don't know, a thousand different pieces of data in it, I could set up my loop and I could just select the ones that I wanted. And I could select something that was an array because you can put an array in a cluster. I could pick up something which was just one Boolean value, one numeric. Okay, so really powerful. Go ahead, you had a question, sir. Um, didn't you just use one of those, uh, one of those nip to function things inside the, the function palette for the block diagram if you wanted to convert age to a string? If, yeah, yeah, if you wanted to convert something, yeah, you could do that, but the re uh, so yeah, you could convert it to a string, but that would, I don't know what that would do, actually. Would that just tell, would that convert what is a numeric into a string? I'd have to try that. Yeah, but you could do that. You can change data types programmatically, so you can change things, but, it, but I don't know what it would do that for a number and a string. I'll have to try that one. Uh, similarly, so that's an example of taking something out of my cluster and looking at what it looks like. What we're doing over here is we're changing something inside the cluster. So here, I'm using bundle by name. So I'm telling it the name of the thing that I want to change. And I've got a little control on my front panel, and that lets me change the, and edit what the age is. Okay? So it's a way of... Uh, in this loop, we've got clusters which allow you to store data and send data and manage it really easily within the loop. And you've got a way of looking at it that we can see here, and we've got a way of editing it, which we can see here, which is really, really uh, an important function. Okay, let's go back to our slides. So clusters recap, we've been through this. We just had a look at that. Uh, error cluster, cluster implementation, we've looked at that. Okay, let's get on to our next part then. We start to get a little bit more interested and a bit more active, Neil. <coughs> Excuse me. So, each week I've been giving you a little MCQ quiz and asking you to engage with it. How have we engaged so far? Okay. So, a little bit of room for improvement. When I was changing my slides, okay, from last year, it was actually 2% for week four in my lecture last year. That isn't a surprise, because some of you are probably thinking, why would I do the quiz before I've done the lecture? I'll wait till the lecture's done. Cool, makes sense to me, so don't worry about the week four. The week one and the week two things are a little bit more worrying. Not so much for me, but I think for you guys, because you're about to start your group project, we're building every week on what we're doing, so 
by every week you're not doing this, you're getting further and further behind. Okay? These things are there to help you. Um, I, could, I could plot a graph and show you, I've got it somewhere, of engagement with these and, and overall mark in the, uh, in the examination. And probably I, if I pull out the data, I could pull out the data which shows when people engaged with it and how they did. Yeah? So try and do these as you go along. If you do it all and you get it all right, cool, that's brilliant. Okay? If you don't, great as well, like I said. Okay? What, am I, what are you getting wrong? Which bit are you struggling with? Go and use that to target some revision. So it should hopefully target what the bits that you know and the bits that you don't know. There's another reason to do this, okay? So we're in week four. At the end of next week, okay, I'm going to do a little uh, raffle and I'm going to look for people who have engaged with them the most and that's going to be the people who have done them all. And then I'm going to select a subset of them, 15 people, and you're all going to get a little treat, okay? Now, I think you'll like the treat, I don't know. But last year, the students really liked the treat. Okay, so I really hope that you're going to engage with it and, and, and I'll, I'll pull it out next week with what you can see. Tell me. Can you ask about the aggregation for some reason? Can you ask about what, sorry? The aggregation, because for some reason, the marks that are saved on the mind marks aren't the latest attempt. They're the first that's, yeah, that's because I, I stole the first attempt. If I stole the latest attempt, then I would hope by the end of that you've done it that you're all getting it all right. But by storing the first attempt, because it, it doesn't count for any credit, Right? But what it is for me, useful for me, is to see how you're doing the first time you do it and for me to understand how you've done and what I want to recap to cover for you. So that, that's, that's just for me. Wait, so, wait, so I can redo them again and again and again in order to improve my score so I can understand them? Yeah, you can and you'll get those scores, but the score that's displayed to me will just be the first one that you submitted. So this doesn't affect my credit, does it? No, no, there's no credit assigned to these at all. Yeah. So it's not credit bearing. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. I thought it might be a good idea for us to do a few MCQ questions. So now we're going to do a few MCQ questions. You are going to need your phone or your laptop or some other electronic device to look at this. Let me unblank that. We're going to do a bit of Mentimeter. So let's get started. To join Mentimeter, it's going to generate a code. So if you go to menti.com, and the code is 74472717. Cool, lots of thumbs up. That means people are joining. I'll read that out for you again. The code is 74472717. I'll just wait for that number to stabilise. How are we doing on time? Okay, we're doing okay on time. 118, 119. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, that number looks as though it's stabilising. So let's have a let's have a go at these. I, I don't mind if you want to discuss it with the person next to you. But when we come back and we go on to the next question and I feedback what the right answer is, I'd really appreciate it if you keep the noise down so everybody can hear me. Okay? That would be great. So, first question is as follows. Away we go. So when it comes to the exam, I think you've probably got about two minutes per question on average. Okay? So I'll, give, I'll make it a little bit harder. I'll give you about a minute. <coughs> Excuse me. Check my answers. Okay, last few seconds to vote. It was pretty constant. Okay, let's look at the correct answers there. So these are the correct answers. Let me explain this to you then. So while loops can execute zero times is incorrect because a while loop has a condition terminal. 
And the loop has to execute to say what value is wired to my condition terminal. If it's true, it'll stop straight away, but it's executed once. Okay? While loops must, must execute at least once is the correct answer. While loops have a conditional terminal is the correct answer. While loops can theoretically run infinitely is also the correct answer because we've got our stop button and it's going to keep going for as long as we want until we press that stop button. Okay, so those, that's an example of a multiple choice question similar to what I would ask you in the exam. Let's do the next question then. So which of the following statements about timing functions are correct? We've just looked at timing functions in some of the VIs that we've done. It's looking fairly static. Okay, let's have a look at the answer to that then. So. A wait function inside a loop allows the VI to sleep for a set amount of time is correct. Okay, one of the reasons why we like adding the timing functions is it tells the, gives the processor enough time that it knows what it's got to do with other resources. Okay, so it allows the computer to manage its overhead. Timing functions control the frequency that the loop executes. That's true. So if you want to do high speed data acquisition, you need to set the timing for that loop. And it's just one over the sample time. Okay, so if you set the loop to run um, one once per second, one over that is one hertz. Okay, so your frequency of your loop is one hertz. Tell me. If we set the like, weight thing to be something really small, like one millisecond. Okay. Absolutely. It depends on the system that you've got. And probably on the computers that you'll find in the cluster, you'll probably find that you can maybe get to around 50 milliseconds, at which you'll start to get a problem. What you can do is what I'd advise you in, and I think I've put it on the, I might have put this in the MyDat lab, I can't remember, I'll have to go and check, is you can put a little function in the loop which works out how long it took the loop to execute. So you can say, hey, I'm setting it to 50 milliseconds, and when it finishes, you can look and long and say, well, how long did it actually take? So you've, a you've asked a really, really good question. How do I get a high-speed uh, loop? What you need to do is you need to use a real-time operating system. And what that is, that's not a computer which has uh, where the, the priorities when I put Facebook on or decide to watch a movie, that it will slow it down because it's doing other things. But a real-time operating system will have a dedicated piece of hardware and a dedicated operating system and allow you to do really high-speed data acquisition. Yeah, and that data acquisition might be gigahertz, okay? So 10 to the 9 samples per second. So pretty, pretty quick stuff, which is really important for applications of when you're trying to control the, the plasma in a nuclear fusion reactor, which is what they're useful with the PXI system down in Cullum. So yeah, really good question. Um, Next part, timing functions provide the processor with the time to complete other tasks is correct. Timing functions should not be used inside case structures. Okay? Any questions? Okay, let's do the next question. So which of the following statements about ADCs, analog to digital converters, and digital to analog converters, DACs, are correct? I 
think it looks as though we're stabilising. Okay, last couple of seconds. Vote now. So, correct answers. DI, DAC is optimised for resolution and sampling rate. Is incorrect, they're usually optimised for one or the other. Uh, ADCs, so analog to digital converters, are needed for DAQ systems that use personal computers. Yes, absolutely. Computers are digital systems. Okay, so we've got to, we've got to change our analog signals, okay, into digital signals for them to be processed by a computer. An analog signal which is passed to an ADC and then to a DAC will be unaltered in comparison to the original signal. No, that isn't true. If you imagine I've got continuous waveform and then I digitise it. If I digitise it, that means I don't have an infinite resolution anymore. It means that representation is going to be a little bit square-like Okay, when I go into the continuous time. Then I make a digital signal of that, the noughts and ones. And then what we're saying with a digital analog converter is I'm taking my digital signal out and I'm forming it now into an analog signal. Well, if you've already made your signal quantized, when you go back and you try and make it into a lovely smooth analog uh, signal, you won't do it. You'll still get a digitized signal. So you do lose resolution and accuracy if you do a uh, analog to digital conversion and then a, uh, a digital to analog conversion and back. Okay, so that's why that's not true. And the last one, ADCs are optimised for either resolution or sampling rate. rate. Is, is correct. They are optimised for one or the other. Let's do the next question. So which of the following statements are correct regarding arrays? Just looked at arrays. More than one answer may be correct. Okay, last couple of seconds. Looks like everybody's voted. Let's look at the results then. So, you can create an array of arrays. Is incorrect. You cannot have an array of arrays. You can have multi-dimensional arrays, but you can't have an array of arrays. You can have an array with more than three dimensions. Yes, you can have arrays up to, what was it? Uh, 2 to the power 32 minus 1 dimensionality. I don't know what that looks like, but you can have that much dimensionality. It is possible to have a 2D array of string data types. It's correct. You can have an array of Boolean values, choose or falses, noughts and ones, whatever you want to think about it. You can have an array of strings. You can have an array of double precisions. You can have different types of arrays of different data types. The first element in an array is indexed at 0. Yes, it's a 0 indexed. Okay, so the very first, if you imagine a two-dimensional array, the top left element is element 0, 0. Everything's 0 indexed in, in LabVIEW. When a loop starts, the first iteration is loop 0, not loop 1. Good. So we're doing all right with these. Excellent. Which of the following statements about arrays and clusters are correct? Uh... We've just done that one, excuse me, haven't we? Clusters can get... Oh, no, 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 arrays and clusters. No, let's do this one. Couple more seconds whilst you vote.
Okay, let's look at the answers then. So, arrays do not have to be a fixed size. That's true. So anybody who's done text-based programming will know about dynamic assignment of memory. Okay, so just you can dynamically assign the size of something. So what that means is you set aside a certain amount of memory and it will know how big that array is. So it will just store data in it. You don't have to tell it it's of a certain size. Okay, you cannot have an array of arrays is correct. A cluster cannot contain Boolean data is incorrect. A cluster can contain any data type. You can put multiple arrays in a cluster if you want. You can put Booleans, you can put strings, you could put an array of Booleans and an array of strings. Clusters can contain more than one data type. It is true, we've already seen in the example, we can put multiple types of data in a cluster. Now, we've got one more question to do, but when we finish the quiz, Okay, if you put your email address in, it will email your results to you about how you did in the quiz. And please use those questions and, and think about, hey, I aced it, all's good, or what's this lab view about? I might need to go and have a look at the resources. Okay, so use them to help you. We're going to do something slightly different now. We're going to move on and we're going to look at assessment criteria exercise. So we're going to look at good programming practice. Okay, good programming practice. And the activity is going to go as follows. Uh, we pop, we'll probably do about more like seven minutes, I think. So we're going to inspect a VI that I'm going to put on the board, and I want you to list the poor block diagram layout and functionality. So I'm going to ask you to think for a few minutes. I want you to make some notes about what you think the poor programming practice is, and then we're going to go back to Mentimeter, and I want you to enter what you think is the poor programming practice. So let me put that in a simpler way. I've created a VI and it's a good example of a bad example. Okay, and I want you to tell me what's the bad programming practice. And this is really important because when you submit your coursework, I do expect you to use good programming practice and these are the types of things that you're gonna lose marks for. Okay, so we use good programming practice. Why do we use good programming practice? Why are software engineers so pedantic about good programming practice? Because, it enables you to understand how the code works a lot quicker. It enables you to identify where there are errors with the code. It enables somebody else to pick up the code and edit it. Okay, if I start calling variables after my, my pet dog, okay, and somebody else picks it up, they're gonna be like, what's Milo? What's this variable called Milo? Okay, nobody's gonna know. So we need to adhere to that good programming practice. Lab view is just the same in terms of how data flows across the diagram and how we do things. I've talked enough. So now, I'll give you five minutes on this. Let me set my stopwatch. You can talk to your, your, to your person you sat next to. Um, so talk for five minutes. Identify all of the bad programming practice with this VI, please. Away we go. We've got five minutes to work on this. What have I done badly here? What are my mistakes with this code?
Okay then. So, let's have a, let's have a go then. Let's go back to Menti. What are the errors that we've got? Tell me what errors you have identified. Lack of labels. Yes. Good. Number one, okay, there's no commenting, okay? It doesn't matter quite so much for a small program like this because you can work out what's going on. But when it becomes a really large programming, you do expect to see some commenting. It should be neat, it should be clear, and it should be concise. On commenting, if I open it up and I feel like you've submitted an essay, okay, that also detracts from how easy it is to understand the code. So you want just enough to give the information, but you shouldn't be writing paragraphs and paragraphs of information. Okay, so it's, it's a bit of a fine balance. It's a bit like a glass of orange juice. If you put too much water in it, it doesn't taste very nice, or if it's too strong, it doesn't taste very nice. So commenting, wires overlapping, yes. Okay, wires are overlapping. Can you follow how the data flows in this diagram with the wires? No, you can't, because my wiring is awful. Okay, so your wires should be wired neatly, absolutely. Spaghetti wiring, exactly. Cross wires, yes. Overlapping, no labels. What else have we got? Um, waveform chart not viewed as an icon on the block diagram. Yes, I, I like, well, that's, this is this waveform chart. I like them to be an icon because it's the smaller and you can see them. But actually, it doesn't matter if you want to put it like that. If you prefer it like that, that that's absolutely fine. That, that isn't bad programming practice. Um, Double precision data connected with an I32-bit data. So where are we here? Yes. So look, here we've got double precision, which is orange. And here I've got what's probably an I32 or it's definitely a, an integer number. And this function here has got a little coercion dot, which says I've got a data mismatch. And that becomes particularly problematic if you want to do things at high speed. If you want to do high frequency applications and you have data mismatches, it means like we had the comment over here before, the loop won't run as we would want as quickly as we'd want it to. It will slow down the execution. So that's another error. Let's keep going and see what else we've got. Lack of captions, labels, lines in a mess, anything new. Too close together, yes, so spacing things out, yes, so it looks, it looks good, yeah. So lots on wire. Oh dear, okay, I agree. I agree. 
Spider-Man. My son's into Spider-Man at the moment. Uh, okay. The Dyer T Fast to the right, goodness, okay. Um, okay, yes, yeah, so, so we can move these over and maybe align these over here so it's near, yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying there, yeah. Not one that I got, but I, I, I don't, I, I, you wouldn't lose marks for that, but I see where you're coming from. Um, coercion points, yes, yeah, so I think we'll just be, I'm not angry, just disappointed. Okay, who's, who's quoting me back to me? Okay, yeah, speak to my son about that. Okay, right, let's look at the solutions then. So let's go through these. Last thing that we're looking at. So, data does not flow from the left to the right. In LabVIEW programming, our data should flow from the left to the right. If you've got data going from the right to the left, that's bad programming practice. So that's one that we haven't picked up so far. There are coercion dots. There were two coercion dots in there. There was one on the, what was it, add, add, divide, I can't remember, sign. But there was also one in the top left-hand corner, which was around, uh, I think it was around the timing. We had a coercion dot up there, which was, which was problematic. We've got... Um, the code on the block diagram is not well spaced. We got that one, so we actually got four. The code is, is well commented to aid understanding. That's good practicing if we have commenting. Longer wires have labels to indicate their content. So let's go back to the, the model example here. So what have I done? I've right clicked on my wire and I've given it a label. And now wherever I move that wire, it's going to tell me what that data is in there. Okay, so that's good programming practice as well. We can see that this looks a lot nicer and neater. That's probably the right level of commenting. There's not lots and lots of text there. Controls and indicators have descriptives, names, and units. Okay, so those are all the examples of good programming practice. I think probably we got four of those as a group. Okay, so there's a little bit more to understand, to reflect on in terms of your good programming practice. And this is your help now before I mark the group project. Let me just explain to you the way that I mark examination papers, and I think the way most of my colleagues mark examination papers. I'm not saying all of them, but I think most of them. I do not sit there when it comes to marking things, make myself a cup of tea and think, let's see how low a mark I can give today. Okay, that isn't the way we work, okay? We want you to demonstrate what you know, and we want to give you marks for what you've put down. Okay, it's completely the other way around. We're not trying to cross marks off. We're trying to give you marks for things. And that's what this exercise is about today. It's about learning what the MCQ test is going to be about when we do that for the final examination and practicing. It's about focusing on what the, uh, some of the assessment criteria that we'll use for the group project. Something a little bit better uh, than me speaking to you with PowerPoint slides uh, for an hour. That concludes our lecture today. Does anybody have any questions? And if you don't want to, if you don't want to ask me, um, uh, oh yeah, if you don't want to ask me directly, you can ask a question up here. Any questions before we finish? No. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. I'll put the slides on blackboard for you. Thank you. Hello. That's okay, you're not bothering me. Tell me. Okay, so last week, mm. um, I remember we had a session, right? Yeah, yeah. But we actually, me and my colleagues, we actually didn't do it. But <laughs> yesterday, my friend told me the rules of tweets that should be denied during the last session. Okay, so we missed the quiz. Okay, okay. So, what should we do? We actually did everything we did. Okay, so I will check out. I am just going through the results at the moment. And those people who have not completed it, I will contact and we'll have a discussion. So we'll have a bit of a chat about it. Okay. okay, so what about the register? Don't, 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 worry about, don't worry about the credit now. I'm not saying you won't get any, but what I will do is I just need to meet with you and check that you've done the lab. So once I've checked the lab, if you missed it, we're fine. It's okay. Thank you. So long as I am confident that you've done the lab. Okay, okay so don't, don't worry about it. Okay, all right. No, no, my pleasure. No worries. See you later. Thank you. Oh yeah, how are you doing? Uh, Tell me. Summer internships? Yeah, yeah, as in like, I know that the department has its own set of uh, projects that they have uh, sort of published on the website. Yeah. Uh, but I just wanted to uh, 
Ask if there are any other things. So, uh, yeah, I, I do. I've got multiple projects at the moment that are ongoing. I don't know quite what the rules are in terms of whether I'm allowed to offer them outside of the department. But if you want to get involved in a little bit, we'll be happy to have you on board. So, um, yeah, because yeah. I saw your work on the yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. and the bio. So, so remind me later on towards the summer and think about when you're going to be available and then I can find stuff. And if you want to get involved, I'd love for you to be involved. Uh, sure, okay, thank you so okay, much. What's your name? Are you? How do I spell that? E-R-Y-A. A-R-Y. -A. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, you've emailed me, right? Uh, yeah. or, or you've put something on the blackboard. Oh, yeah, 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 I have. Yeah, yeah. I, I missed yeah, yeah. my lab session, yeah. actually. Okay, yeah, that's what it was. I remember, I recognise you now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Cool. I mean, I'm hoping to make the next one. So okay. I think. Okay, cool. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. See you. Take care. Hi, yeah. How are we doing? Hi. I have two questions about the course, right? Okay, tell me, good. Yeah, yeah we've looked at it. Team. Excellent. Yeah, we've met already with the team. We sat down, started to awesome. some tasks and all Great. I just have two questions, right? Mm. So, the main idea, right, behind yep. the project is yeah. to have this like uh, 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters block. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Analyze that, right? Yep. And uh, just literally program the code because we have yeah, yeah, yeah. the yep. parts and bits, the point VI yep. uh, bits, and we just have to assemble all that together. Exactly, yeah. Awesome. Yep. And I just wanted to know when is, because I know groups is 64, which is row four, column four. So, we okay. know that little I will, spot. I will tell you, I'll put a spreadsheet online and tell you exactly what your code is. <laughs> Oh, oh, I do. No, in fact, no, no, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm mis miscommunicating and misremembering what I did last year. <laughs> All you need to remember is that you're group 64. And then you need to do everything so that I think I'll have to check the coursework, but I think if it, you've got a square, yeah? I yeah, think yeah. I've said the bottom left square is zero, zero. So all of your numbers just need to be, but if it's in millimeters, if it's, and, and if it's a a 100 millimetres by 100 millimetres, yeah. the numbers just need to be 0 to 100, That's the way you want to put it. And, and then you're probably the next question you're going to ask me is, well, I, get, I have to make this many measurements, how do I do that? Yeah. Use a logical thing. If this is my space, right, yeah, yeah. if you submit stuff and you've done them all here, right, of course, what yeah. are you doing? Why yeah, would you yeah, do yeah. that? Right. Sense, yeah, you know, if this is your space, you want some kind of like logical, yeah. and, and how do you do that? I don't care whether they're equally distance or they're all. I don't, I don't really mind. There's just got to be some logic yeah, behind it. Get a decent spec because yeah. you don't know whether there's something metallic there or not. Okay? Uh, and and what, you know, is imagine this let's be like. Yeah, it's a heat map. Yeah, you want a heat map and you want to try and cover the whole area. I see. So, so you can't get everything. You're going to have can't, the dead zones. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So try and optimise it. But don't, don't you know. I've seen people go, ah, oh, I've run this program to get the exact, the best on. Mm -hmm. I'm not after that. I mean, if you want to do that, cool. But I think that's additional time yeah. that you spend in doing something. And, and you'd be far better maybe watching the football or something, you know? <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Um, I did have a question, actually, for the coursework. It yeah. doesn't have to be scalable in any way. Uh, because it's for 100 by 100, does it, it doesn't, that doesn't have to be some kind of input function to scale that? Or? No, I don't think you have to scale it, but if your program has the ability that I could change the coordinates and you could adapt for that, then great. And if you do it all zero to 100, then it will, right? Because if I say 64, I've got the reference point for the naught naught for you. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I say this is a global frame, I know you're 64. So I just do a translation, you know, yeah. you just say you're there. But, but then if you... you to scale, yeah, but then it's, if, if you become group number two, well, your numbers are all the same for group two. It's just opposite, so that should be fine. Right. I see. Okay. That should be good, yeah. yeah. Happy? Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. My pleasure. Right. Yeah. Was that useful? Yeah, 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 that was good. We're going to okay. sit down again and just talk as a group of levels. Awesome. Yeah, right, thank, you. thank you. See you guys. Hi, yeah. Quick question. Yeah. Was, um, for the final exam, yeah. can multiple answers be correct, like in the weekly quizzes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, so in, the, in the exam, and so what I tried to do there is give you MCQ questions to what you'll get in the exam. Oh, okay, so they can be Yeah, so, so some of them will be single answer. And some of them will be multiple answers. And will they clarify the question? Was yes, it yeah. Okay. I'll always say a single answer is correct, or I will say multiple answers are correct. But it, if it's multiple answers, then you, when you submit it on Blackboard, it won't let you do it unless yeah, yeah. You, it should be really clear. So okay. I'll say it explicitly, and the, the little interface will stop yeah. you making mistakes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Right, no worries. See ya. Hiya. Yeah. Um, for the pre Okay, don't worry. Don't worry about that. So you're in a group team with four other people or five other people, 
only one of you has to submit it. So providing all four of you haven't made the same mistake, it'll be fine. Okay. So don't, don't, nothing to worry about. Perfect, yeah, you. okay. See ya. Oh, okay. Hiya. I about this. I was slightly late to the lab on last week. Okay. And I was put in the code. And someone... Ah, your voltmeter. Yeah, okay.